Okay, welcome again. This is the Laconi Technical Services section program on the RDA Toolkit. To, uh, the chair of today's program, I wanna give a big thank you to Shelly Sandstrom from the Naperville Public Library. Our speaker is Amanda, S she told me how to pronounce her name and I've Sprack already I. pronounced it. <laughs> Um, Amanda um, is a librarian and professional cataloger at the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri. She specializes in the cataloging of rare books and special materials, medical and veterinary resources and digital resources. She is a member of the ACRL Rare Books and Manuscripts Division, the Library History Roundtable, ALA Core and the Mid-Continental Chapter of the Medical Library Association. She has served as the Medical Library Association's representative to the ALA Committee on Cataloging, Description and Access, and recently served as the chair of the Fictitious Entities Working Group for the RDA Steering Committee. She was also a member of the RSC Plus Group, working on the RDA 3R project, she teaches principles of cataloging and classification for the University of Missouri School of Information Science and Learning Technology. So welcome, Amanda. I will stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Thanks. Um, and just, yeah, and just a reminder, if you have any questions during the program, please um, enter your question in chat or raise your hand. And when we have an opportunity, we will then um, ask that question of Amanda. So thank you, it's all yours. Great, um, thank you so much, Joy. I'd like to thank um, you and Shelly for, um, where did my PowerPoint go? Uh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, hold on a second. Oh, it says my screen sharing is paused, okay. Um, Hold on one second. Sorry, folks. It was all queued up and now it's not. Um, okay, there's a there's a technical glitch. It says my screen sharing is paused. So is that something on your side? Oh, nothing wants to open now. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm sorry, folks. This was working just a minute ago, of course. Let me queue it up again and see what happens. Um, so anyway, I would thank you very much um, to Laconi and to um, Shelly and Joy um, for asking me to speak today. Um, I want to uh, I want to start out by saying um, that I was on the RSC Plus committee, which what that basically was, was the RSC, so the RDA steering committee, who's the lovely people responsible for, for RDA, whom you may curse at your leisure, as you will, um, for what's going on with RDA. Um, they opened it up to, um, to adding some um, other people to the committee to work on specific um, sort of technical issues. I had um, been working with the committee at the Library of Congress dealing with um, fictitious entities in RDA um, because that's a whole, we'll get into that, but that's a whole can of worms um, in RDA. Um, and okay, can you see my slides now? Joy, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see the I, slides? I can see them, Amanda. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that uh, what that glitch was, but now it's working, so I'm not going to worry about it. Um, so the uh, I was actually the um, the chair of a committee that was looking at fictitious entities um, for RDA um, at ALA on the CCDA, which is the you know librarians and acronyms. So the Committee on Cataloging, Description, and Access. Um, and was asked to chair the committee um, for the um, the RSC, and then they invited the chairs of all their sort of task groups together to make this sort of 
bigger version of RSC. It was still about 20 people. It wasn't huge um, to work on some of the the knottier problems um, of trans of trans during the translation of RDA with the three art project to the new RDA, which they're now calling the official RDA, um, as opposed to the original RDA. And I know somewhere in this talk, I'm going to get that messed up because they're both O's and it's very confusing. Um, so out of all this sort of Mijagas that's been going on, um, they've sort of, as most of you know, they've rewritten the RDA toolkit. And I have to say that um, the sort of state that it's in right at the moment is very confusing. So if you're confused, um, don't worry, you are not alone. Um, I was on the committee and I'm confused. <laughs> so when Shelly asked me to, uh, to give this presentation, I gave it with the caveat that um, I will do my best to explain what I understand about what's going on. Um, I'm no longer officially on the RSC, so I can't really speak for the RSC um, in this way, but, um, but I will sort of, I will, this is the what you're going to get is the best of my understanding um, from what's going on about of what is going on. Um, understand that things are highly in flux light right now, and they may um, drastically change. There's no way of knowing. So I might tell you something today, and it might be different next week. And sorry about that. No control. Um, and hopefully we'll go through some of the sort of the issues and the naughtier problems. Um, what we're going to do first is look at just some, um, so a little bit of historical background, because I'm a teacher, so you always, and I love library history, so you're going to get a little bit of library history, so where we started, and then we'll talk about where we are now, and sort of what the implications of that are. So, um, please do ask questions um, in the chat if you have them as you go along, and I'm going to periodically kind of stop and answer those. Um, the presentation is long enough that I think um, that's the best way to go, because otherwise, if you wait till the end, it'll be very confusing. So a little bit of cataloging history, like I said, because I can't stop myself and also because my former life before I was a librarian, I was an Assyriologist and I translated cuneiform documents. So you got to have the obligatory cuneiform document up here. Um, so remember that um, ever since people have basically started writing either somewhere, somewhere in either Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt, they've generated texts. So they've generated, you know, like notes and all this stuff that they had to store. And so it, you know, it quickly becomes apparent once you get a certain amount of these things that they have to be organized in some sort of way so you're able to find them. Um, so th this um, is actually an old, um, for lack of a better word, it's a tax document. Um, people had to give sheep and goats to the temple to kind of keep the government running just like we pay taxes today. Um, so this is basically says like, you know, how many sheep and goats were given to you know, the temple by whoever and what person and as a way of record keeping. And you can see, on, so this is the main text. And then what the scribes did on the side was actually, this is, um, this is sort of a tally or a way of um, identifying the document because they would store them on their sides. So from the very, very earliest days, there was already, there were already archivists and already um, people who were thinking about how to organize this stuff so that you could go back and find it later. So when you talk about handwritten documents, there are a few ways that you can arrange a catalog. Um, you can have an author catalog. So everything is arranged sort of in alphabetical order by author, the way that a lot of fiction collections today and public libraries are organized because it's just, it's convenient. People understand it, it's intuitive. And then there's class catalogs. So when things are arranged by subject and we generally do nonfiction um, in class catalogs in the, in the country this way. So our, our fiction is usually sort of author arranged, our class catalogs or our classification is usually nonfiction and catalogs can reflect that. So the earliest catalogs were just alphabetical. They were just, you know, lists from, you know, A to Z of either titles or authors. And the question that we struggle with all the time is how do you arrange a library so that it's convenient and useful for users? Um, those of you, obviously, like a lot of you are, you know, are at libraries, you know, who they do reference. Yeah, 
patron comes in and says, you know, I'm looking for so and so. So how do you arrange a collection so it's easy for users to find what they need? So one of the very first library catalogs um, was done by um, Thomas Hyde at the Bodleian. He was a Bodleian librarian, and um, and he came up with this uh, this catalog, um, Impressorium Librorum. So basically a catalog for um, the Bodleian at Oxford University, which is this nice, interesting round building. If you've ever been there, it's 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 a great place. Um, and so he commented, um, he, you know, he labored, he labored mightily, he would let us know, um, and says that, you know, in this work, I've given students a tool to enable each of them to construct for himself and with ease out of this forest of materials an index of selected books that will serve to advance in no small measure his private studies. And I think this is a nice quote because it, um, of course, this is actually translated by William Denton um, because it's in, as you can see, it's in Latin because, you know, in the 17th century, if you were highfalutin, you wrote in Latin. And I don't, my Latin is pretty non-existent. So thank you to William for <laughs> translating that for us. But you can see in here the sort of kernels of technical services and what we do. So what we want to do is is allow our, our patrons to construct for him or her or their self um, out of all the stuff that we have in a library a way to find selected books that they want to advance um, whatever their studies or whatever they are interested in are. So that's kind of the kernel of what we do. So from the beginning, there's been this kind of user-centered focus. So um, Panizzi, who was at the um, who was at the British Museum Library, um, which has now become the British Library, um, came up with this. Um, these uh, 40, um, these 40, these 91 rules, I don't know where 40 came from, sorry, somewhere out of the depths of my brain, um, which is a scary place sometimes, um, came up with, um, he was an Italian who became the librarian at the British Museum. And he came up with a set of rules to um, basically catalog the collection. Up until that time, I, the catalog was, there was sort of a alphabetical catalog and it was kind of a mess and um, it didn't really have um, it really wasn't in you know any kind of order or you know basically very useful for anyone um, it was described on uh, michael gorman in an article called it a disorganized and random collection of books cataloged by indigent clergymen and other part-time drudges <laughs> So basically, if you can imagine as a library coming into a collection, that's basically just a huge pile of stuff. That's what he had to sort of deal with. And so he suggested making an author's subject catalog instead of a class one. They kind of had things just, you know, randomly under like, you know, well, here's our books on geology, you know. So in order to do that systematically, he drew up this list of rules on how to construct a catalog record. And um, the rules themselves were printed in 1841. The trustees of the British um, Library had um, had said that um, they were they were hoping to have the catalog published in 1844. Um, in 1844, they asked Panizzi how it was going, and he told them it wouldn't be ready for at least 10 years. And then in 1847, he told yet another commission that he had um, he'd have everything up to 1854 in the catalog by 1895. So all of us who work in technical services, I love the story because we all we all have backlogs. <laughs> we all understand how that is. So he's like, yeah, I'm working as hard as I can, but it's taken forever. Um, there were opponents to this idea um, who thought that the only reason you really needed a catalog was or the only thing you really needed for a catalog was just a list of titles because people would know what they want and they could just you know it's like well they'll know the book they want and they can just go find it now all of us know that that's not true that when you're doing research often you don't know exactly what you want and um panizzi thought that um as he said a reader may know the work he requires but he cannot be expected to know all the peculiarities of different editions 
And this information he has a right to expect from catalogs. So Panizzi was the first person who saw the catalog as sort of a research tool or a way to actually explore what the library had. And this comes into focus later with RDA when we focus on those user tasks. So he saw the book um, as an edition of a particular work that's intimately related to the other editions and translations of the work that the library may have. And again, we're going to see this echoed in what RDA is trying to do with the library catalog. And he thought that, uh, you know, all this stuff should be integrated, you know, together with them. So slightly after that, we have Charles Cutter at the Boston Boston Athenaeum, um, who came up with rules for a dictionary catalog. And of course, all of us having, or many of us having been through library school, this will look very familiar. <laughs> so he said that um, if a person wanted to find a book, he should be able to find it if he knows the author, the title, or the subject. And that a catalog should show what a library has by a given author, on a given subject, or in a given kind of literature. So, you know, what kind of what kind of books does the library have that are poetry? Or what kind of you know, Western fiction does the library have? And then to assist in the choice of the book as to its edition and as to its character. So the sort of the literary, um, the literary warrant of that. And I think we're I think we're pretty familiar with um, with those rules. So um, Ranganathan, who was a um, who was a very wonderful um, Indian librarian, he actually was trained as a mathematician and um, was extremely logical. And his writing is quite delightful. Um, actually, he's a good writer. And um, he came up with these five laws of library science, which I love because they're simple and they're easy to remember and they pretty much get down to the kernel of it, of what we're trying to do, which is books are for use. Every person his or her book, every book its reader. We want to save the time of the reader and that the library is a growing or organism. And we all know that because we all know that we have stuff coming out of our ears and that <laughs> we have a hard time finding a place for all of it. So um, Seymour Lubetz Lubetzky, who's was probably one of the you know greatest catalogers of the 20th century, if you know you want to if you want to put it that way, um, really took a lot of this background, took a lot of Panizzi and a lot of Cutter and a lot of Ranganathan and, and kind of distilled it down to, we need to simplify cataloging rules. Um, cataloging rules up to them were pretty, they were very prescriptive, meaning it was like, they were very broken down minutely into, you know, if you have a book on law that talks about this, you need to catalog it this way. If you have a fiction book that's by a certain author or is by one author, do it this way. If it's by two authors, you know, so the rules were like laborious and complicated and legalistic, you know, it was like if then sort of things. And he basically said, you know, in, in 1953, one of the things he said was, um, is this rule necessary? He, st he wrote an article called Cataloging Rules and Principles. And I love that. Is this rule necessary? Do we really need it? And that's like the beginning of chapter one. Um, and his work became the foundation of the Paris Principles. Now, the Paris Principles in 1967 came out of a um, out of a convention, um, the International Conference on Cataloging, where they actually got together to talk about sort of how are we going to catalog things and the functions of the catalog. And so out of that came this idea that the catalog should be an efficient instrument for ascertaining whether the library contains a particular book, now this is going to sound familiar, specified by its author and title, its title if there's no author, um, and a suitable substitute for the title, and we all know that's the, you know, make up a title if it doesn't have one thing, and then which books by, which works by a particular author and which editions of a particular work are in the library. So this became the basis of AACR2. And they were common principles on which cataloging codes um, could be based that were both international in scope. So it was sort of an international cataloging code and interoperational. So that, you know, this is, um, this is how we figure out um, that, uh, this is how OCLC or any of our, you know, sort of standard um, cataloging tools work. 
where you know we use rules so that someone you know on the other side of a country or the other side of the world can use the same records that we do because we follow you know certain principles when we make when we make those um, those records bibliographic records and then we've so for about 150 years we've had this long timeline of different rules so you know you have the you have Panizzi and you have Cutter and then you have ALA came out with cataloging rules and the Library of Congress came out with cataloging rules then AACR came out and AACR2 the revised versions um you know so there was this long kind of refinement and um and history of, of you know, rulemaking and refining the rules and working on the rules um, that you know basically happened for the past, you know, from like 1841 to 2002. And everybody, I think this is the last kind of print version of AECR, which finally was a loose leaf and you would, you know, take things out and put things in. I know I have a very annotated um, one of these uh, 1988 versions of AACR too, that's got, you know, things revisions pasted in over the pages and stuff. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we were and, and the rules were constantly being updated and revised um, and, you know, and all, and all this stuff. So there came to be a realization that um, AACR2 needed to be updated yet again, um, because periodically it does, especially because of the, um, the appearance on the scene of a lot of digital resources. Um, so there was too much stuff, too little time and money and technology is changing. And that's the problem never goes away and has been with us since the beginning of time and cataloging, you know, from the beginning of time has basically de dealt with these same, same problems. Um, there really hadn't been any evidence base for why we did what we did. I mean, we have these sort of philosophies that we get from Panizzi and Ranganathan, um, that are good solid philosophies, I think, but no one had ever sat down and think, thought about, well, what is the user, user actually trying to do when they do use a library catalog? You know, when they come in and look in a library catalog, what are they actually trying to accomplish? Um, so in Stockholm, Sweden, they kind of, they had a, another sort of international seminar on um, bibliographic records and basically said, you know, we need to have somebody actually look at this in a formalized way um you know to sort of figure out what is going on and what are we actually trying to um to accomplish so the stockholm seminar talked about you know and and they were there was kind of a lot of a debate and a, they called it a lively discussion um on the quality and functions of bibliographic records so what are we trying to do and some speakers were like well the rules can really be simplified you know it's really it's it's now I think we're all laughing because I don't think anybody's looked at the, you know, the new RDA toolkit and thought this is simplified. <laughs> really? <laughs> um, but the rules could be simplified. Um, and, you know, some people were like, well, we don't need to put as much stuff in the cataloging record as we do. And other people were like, no, we need to put more in. And everybody kind of realized that, you know, we don't really know what part of what we do is actually useful. Um, and that of course by sharing and kind of um distributing the work you know distrib distributing cataloging records on you know platforms like oclc that you know there was what they called an economic advantage meaning it's cheaper um so it was kind of like you know there were a lot of ideas too that things like booksellers and vendors you know people like that could also contribute um, to cataloging records, which they hadn't really been, you know, necessarily taken into account um, the needs of, say, different groups like museums and things like that. Um, so there was a lot of debate going on. And so the sort of end shot of all of this was that they were like, yeah, we need somebody to actually look at all this stuff and figure out what's going on. So, um, oops, sorry, I hit my, I hit my thing. Um, so out of all this came um, came Ifla and um, and Ferber. So the idea that um, there was going to be a study group for Ifla, which is again 
acronyms, the International Federation of Library Associations. So it's like ALA is a member of that, you know, the British Library Association. So all the library associations from all over the world are, you know, a part of IFLA, it's sort of a big umbrella group. And so they decided they were gonna have um, a study group that was gonna come up with what they called the Functional Requirements of Bibliographic Records or FERBER, which I think most of us by now have heard of. When they did their study, they figured out that um, they needed um, they needed to come up with a model that would be useful, and they chose what's called an entity relationship model. Um, that's very common in information and computer science. It's relatively um, it's relatively easy to understand. They needed to decide. Um, what entities we actually talk about when we catalog and how they're related to each other. And all of the results of all of this work came out in 1997. So in the meantime, there was a realization that there needed to be an update to AACR2. At the time, AACR2 had become less useful because of um, things like um, electronic resources, the rules for things were spread out over chapters. So if you had like an electronic serial, those of you who have been around long around, around long enough to remember having to use AA serial two, you'd have to look in the serials chapter and you'd have to then go to in the back and look in the electronic document center and then there'd be conflicting rules that didn't, you know, and you'd have to figure out like, okay, well, which rule do I follow? Because this one rule for serials is telling me this, but this rule for electronic resources is telling me that. So it was, it was not particularly useful. Catalogers didn't know how to resolve those conflicts and there wasn't a lot of guidance. Rules were often duplicated. So like, you know, the same rule that applied for books would be rewritten in the chapter for maps and the chapter for serials and the chapter for electronic resources. So it was a pretty unwieldy thing. Um, a lot of people from the community also wanted to integrate the idea of authority control and authority records into sort of the rules. So with access points, not just how do you establish them, but then how are they arranged in authority files and what is an authority file anyway? Um, AACR2 was still based on those old card catalog methods of entry. So we still talked about things like um, like um, uniform titles and you know a lot of the verbiage that we've we've sort of over time, you know, main title entry um, that was sort of less important in a digital world because with computers, you know, it wasn't like you had to have a main title card in your card catalog that had all the information and then the other like the other cards in the card catalog would be minimal and would sort of refer you to that first card and you know in a digital database it's all in one record so whatever came first didn't really matter um aacr2 was you know anglo-american cataloging rules i mean it was meant for english language speaking cataloging but it, it had sort of become the de facto standard used in a lot of non-English speaking countries. So therefore it was, you know, it was pretty biased towards English language resources, which was fine because that's what it was meant for, but it became a pretty much de facto international standard. So there was a problem with dealing with sort of different languages and the ways that different languages express things. And contents and carriers in AACR2 are often confused. So what something is or what it's about is often confused with the carrier that it is. So, you know, um, you know, content is it's a it's a film, you know, it's a two dimensional moving image. The carrier is, you know, is it could be videotape or it could be video disc or it could be, you know, it could have a different carrier. And so when you say it's a film, does that mean it's literally on film or that it's a movie that could be on different media so it you know it got it was just it was just very confused so it was a it was the ifla conference um there was an there was a conference on principles um it was the international conference on principles and future development of aacr in toronto and it was a fundamental rethinking of the cataloging code so what if we're going to update aacr to what are we really trying to accomplish? And um, 
so the new standard and thinking about it in 2004 and updating AACR2 started really happening um, about then. And it, so they, they wrote a new draft for that they called AACR3 and they put it out there and they let people comment on it. And they got so many comments back. And as they went out through those, they realized that um, that people were really, the changes or the problems that people were identifying were such that the whole thing really had to be rethought, that you couldn't just sort of tidy up AACR2 around the edges, that it really needed a whole rethink from beginning to end. And so this was kind of the birth of RDA. So in December 2005, the first draft of RDA went out. And, um, and in October 2007, the Joint Steering Committee for RDA um, decided to reorganize um, because of the changes and, and, uh, and basically having a whole new organization for what turned out to be RDA. And they renamed themselves um, RSC, so the RDA Steering Committee, rather than the Joint Steering Committee for AACR2. And the first RDA was actually published as the RDA Toolkit in 2010. And so that's kind of where we are now. So RDA is based on um, the IFLA, Ferber, and FRAD entity relationship models. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sorry if this is a repeat for some of you, because I'm not quite, I'm not, I wasn't quite sure like how much background people had. So, you know, go get a cup of coffee if this is old hat. And, you know, <laughs> you're like, yeah, okay, I know this. I don't, you know, I don't need to deal with it again. Um, but um, RDA was a cataloging standard that was um, based on the IFLA, Ferber, and FRAD relationship models. So what came out of that IFLA paper. And the structure was changed from a um, resource based on the kind of resource you had. So if you had a book, you would go to the book chapter, or if you had a video recording, you'd go to the video recording chapter. And it was, it was organized in a more general sort of model um, and was arranged according to the Ferber bibliographic entities, which are work, express, expression, manifestation, and item, and the relationships between those. Again, um, entity um, relationship models are very common in computer science, and they were picked deliberately because of the increasing, obviously, um, digitization of library catalogs, you know, I, it, at least, at least in the West, you know, very few of us, I think, use um, card catalogs anymore. Most of us have some sort of web pack. Um, and for those of you who may be in very small public or school libraries who still use card catalogs, I apologize, um, because they are out there. Um, but there are many, many more um, digital catalogs now than there used to be. Um, and so, and the other thing that it did is it, it became a lot more flexible. And this is sort of, this is both the sort of beauty and the bane of catalogers with RDA is that there's a lot more options and there's a lot more cataloger judgment. Um, I teach cataloging and my students really hate when they ask me a question and I'm like, well, it's catalogers judgment and they groan because they just wanna know, no, it's like, how do we do it? You know, and I'm like, well, it depends. <laughs> And they don't like that. They want the rule. You know, they want you to tell them, you know, what is the rule? So what is Ferber? Um, first of all, it's technically it's supposed to be FRBR. Um, if like it's very mad when people call it Ferber, but everybody calls it Ferber. So I'm just gonna call it Ferber. Um, it's an entity relationship um, model that describes the world in terms of things, entities, and the relationship between those things. So you can say that, you know, thing, person, Jenny Lawson, and she wrote a book called Broken. And so Jenny Lawson thing is an entity and the book Broken is a thing. And the relationship between them is she is the author of that book. So Jenny Lawson is the author of entity book Broken. It defines four user tasks. So remember, they went back and kind of looked at what are users actually trying to do um, when they are looking for something and they're trying to find something. So that makes sense. It's like, I wanna find a book. They're trying to identify it. So they go in the catalog and they look up a book and they get this whole list of stuff. And it's like, okay, out of that, pick out what I'm looking for. They wanna select it. 
So it's like, okay, so here's my title and there's an ebook and an audio book and a print book. And so I wanna select the one that I want or there's four editions, which edition do I want of that? The latest, the earliest, and then they want to attain, obtain it. Obviously they want to go to the shelf or they want to download the PDF or the ebook or whatever it is so they can use it. And so Ferber sort of recognized that these are, you know, these are these tasks. And you'll find that, remember going back to talking about Panizzi and some of the early guys who were, and they were guys mostly, I'm um, talking about this, that, you know, this, this FISO, F-I-S-O, find it and if I select and obtain, um, you know, comes, is just sort of a modified version of, you know, what they have kind of been saying all along. So here's a nice little complicated <laughs> little graph of what's going on. So you have a work and a work is sort of, um, a work isn't a physical thing. It's sort of an intellectual idea, a creation or an intellectual idea. So Alice in Wonderland is it exists in Lewis Carroll's head as a work. And the expression that's realized through an expression. So it's realized it's, it's realized through text in the English language. And again, the expression is also sort of an intellectual concept rather than an actual physical thing. When it's actually embodied or written down or recorded some way, it becomes a manifestation. So the expression is manifested. And that's what we catalog. We catalog manifestations. Um, you know, in modern publishing, you know, if a if a new book comes out, the newest, you know, um, James Patterson, God help us all, book comes out, and um, you know, all of those books are exactly the same. So we catalog at that manifestation level, and then the one that we actually have, the exemplar of that manifestation that we have in our library, the item is the one that we get. And that's the one that we, the item is where we stick on our barcode and we stick on our, you know, our shelf label and our, the call number that we're using in our library and all that stuff. And we may make notes about things like if our individual copy is signed or if it is billed because it got checked out and didn't get returned, you know, all of that stuff. But when you think about it, when we catalog, at least on if we're using OCLC or or you know doing a master record, we don't put our own like personal libraries information in there, um, but we do catalog the manifestation. So the author, the title, the publisher, you know those kind of things, and then all of these things um, can have subjects, and they can have entities like people or corporate bodies related to them, and so. It's basically this entity relationship model is just a work, you know, has a subject concept. So entity, entity, relationship. Work, concept, entities, they have a relationship that joins them together. So at that level, it's pretty simple. You know, you can pretty much um, relate anything in the world. You know, you can relate yourself to anything out in the world just by a relationship. Like, you know, I, Amanda, have, you know, on my desk, that's my relationship, a cup with pens in it, that's the entity. So, you know, you can pretty much describe anything in those terms. So Ferber came up with basically three groups. So you have the creations, so the work, expression, manifestation, and item. You have the creators, the people, the corporate bodies, and corporate bodies include things like, you know, um, conferences and, you know, ships and all those things that we consider to be families, you know, corporate bodies. Um, corporate body is technically a group of people who get together to do something as a corporate body. And then group, group three, which are subjects, which can be concepts like topics, objects, events, or places. You know, you can have a book on Woodstock or you can have a book on New York. Um, but Group one or two entities, so people can also be a subject and a work can be a subject. So you can have a book that is a critical examination of, you know, the use of landscape in Moby Dick. You know, that's that Moby Dick, the work would be, you know, would be a subject in that case. So again, just a simplified version of the Ferber model, because this is kind of the kernel of RDA and even RDA now, the new RDA, is that you have a work that's realized through an expression that's embodied in a manifestation and is exemplified by an item. And all of these um, 
all of these basically work, you know, work in tandem. So, um, so an ex uh, work is realized through an expression an expression realizes a work. So um, in the model relationships are reciprocal. So here's a real world example. If you have um, the work Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire by JK Rowling. Um, so Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire as sort of an intellectual enter enterprise, you know, the thing that JK Rowling created as a creation, again, which is sort of is not a is not a physical reality thing. It's the idea of the work, you know, exists out there. And then Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire can have many different expressions. So the original English text, you know, so a textual resource is going to be one expression. An audio book, so the the book read as an audio thing is going to be another expression. Um, a translation of Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire into French or German is going to be yet another expression. <laughs> and then it becomes realized or real life becomes a real boy <laughs> um, when it's manifested. So the expression Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire has one manifestation, which is the American scholastic version that we all know and love and have multiple copies of in our libraries. The, um, ex this expression, original English text, is also going to have a manifestation of the original version that came out in England. Um, I can't remember who the publisher of that was. I know that some people collect both the English copies, original English versions and the scholastic versions for people who are real fans. Um, so that's going to be a different manifestation of the same expression. And then <coughs> the items are going to be the ones that sit on the shelves in our library. So we may have three copies in our library, one of which copy two has been missing since you know February of 02 because someone took it out and never returned it. They also came up with some models for authority data and subjects. Um, these were not quite as fleshed out as um, as Ferber was. And um, sorry, I have a frog. <coughs> and so um, they also are entity and relationship models for things like, you know, bibliographic entities. So people like, you know, authors or works are known by names, you know, this this work has the title Moby Dick. And then we base our control to access points on those. <laughs> so out of all of that modeling came um, what I like to call RDA original flavor. <laughs> so the one that we've been using, you know, for the past decade or so on and off um, is the original toolkit that we all know and love and we've just gotten used to using before they upended our world and decided they're going to change it all and you know have it do something else so um, it's organized though unlike aacr2 which was organized by type of resource like books whatever it's it's works entities manifestations and um, items so the work it doesn't matter if it's a book or it's a recording or it's whatever it's a work and we can basically we can model what we do with that because we do basically the same things when we record bibliographic data no matter you know what it is that we're recording. We may use slightly different techniques depending on it, or we may add different information to the um, bibliographic record, depending on what kind of um, format we may be using. But underlying it, this WEMI sort of idea is, is holds for no matter what kind of resource you have. So it's a much more general and much less sort of what people complained about, sort of the legalistic, you know, if you have a book, do this. If you have a video recording, do this. What RDA basically says is it doesn't matter. You can sort of treat them all the same. So in the original toolkit, um, there was space left open for the ideas of object, concept, place, and time. Um, they hadn't really been fully developed um, in the facade model. They were just kind of working on this when some, when the new idea came out and then they kind of dropped it. <laughs> but if you look in the original toolkit, 
and um, I'm afraid to do this. I could try and see what happens. Um, so Joy, tell me if um, y'all can't see, I gotta change my screen that I'm sharing. Um, let me see if I can pull up the original toolkit here. So hopefully you can see the original toolkit. So yes. Okay, great. So if you look at the original toolkit, you can see that you know, it arranged, so here's manifestation and item, you know, it was arranged up here, and then the attributes of work and expression. And again, although there are some, there are some things on, you know, tips on, um, say, if you go into publication, you know, oh, sorry, I have to log in. <laughs> I'm sure you have super secret logins that are horribly hard to guess to get into your RDA toolkit too, if you have it. Um, but you'll see it says recording publication statement. It doesn't say a book publication statement or a recording, you know, it just says publication statement, no matter, you know, what, what sort of thing you have, the publication statements are all pretty much the same. And then they do give, um, you know, then we have, you know, like our little like policy statements so there's a german one and you know here's one for library of congress that says okay this is a little unclear are there some options so here's the options that we take but you can see that they don't really talk about you know particular types of resources they just say a work or a carrier um, no matter what kind of carrier it is um, but in the original toolkit if you go down and you look at um let's see what uh Related, con yeah, to, de to be developed after the initial re release of RDA, 2010, never developed. <laughs> and in part, that's because, as we will go on um, and see, um, life intervened and other things started happening. And that's kind of where we are now. So let me go back to my PowerPoint presentation. Okay. And hopefully you can see the PowerPoint again. So that's kind of where we were. So here's a screen. I had a screenshot just in case that didn't work. Um, so in the midst of all this <laughs> and working on RDA and trying to finish it up and trying to do all that good stuff um, comes the library reference model. And so this basically happened because remember we had those we had those three separate kind of models that were originally working together so we had ferber we had the frad the authority um, model part and we had the subject authority model part and ifla was like you know rather than do these separately why don't we all kind of try to combine this into one thing so out of the combination of those three things came the library reference model. And again, this is a entity relationship model at a very high level, which means it's very generalized. Um, it's just a model. It's not rules. It's not implementations. It's not, you know, it's just, it literally just models the kinds of things that we do and how we do it. Um, so it models what is already existing. Um, and it underlies the rules. It's sort of the, the structure of which we form, you know, we formulate the rules underneath this model, um, but it's not the actual like rules themselves. And it's, um, it was developed on purpose as an entity relationship model to work with what's called the semantic web, or you can think of it as the thinking web is how I like to think about it. And this is basically means writing things in a way that machines can parse and understand them, and they can understand the relationships between two things. And this is kind of what this kind of technology is what underlies like an Amazon when you know, it's like, if you liked this, you should try that. Um, you know, it's kind of, because it makes relationships between things that are similar or that are the same thing. Um, and the other thing that it is, the reason, the other reason that it's very simple is because it's meant to be expanded. So this was meant to be sort of the high level kind of model and that um, other communities and of which RDA, you know, is one of the communities that's using this model can actually refine it and, um, and make it more complicated as they need to. Um, so it's meant, you know, at the top level, it's meant to be pretty simple. And it really is pretty simple. It reconciles 
Ferber and Frad. So again, it goes back to that idea of um, catalogers and people who work with the catalog wanting um, some of that authority data information and authority control in with the descriptive cataloging elements. So description and access. And it really doesn't talk about subjects. Um, subjects, you know, it's description and access. It's not also, you know, so subject analysis is kind of set outside and is basically for um, different communities to decide how they want to handle subjects. It's not a part of the model. So for most of us, you know, in the US, we use the Library of Congress subject headings or Sears or something like that. Um, and you can use any kind of sort of subject schema that you want with the model, but the model itself doesn't really deal with subjects. And it's meant to be platform and encoding standard neutral. So what that means is you can code this in MARC, you can code it in XML, you can code it in, um, you know, um, MODS or EAD or Dublin Core. You can use it in card cataloging cards for that matter. You know, it, it doesn't matter how you put the information in. So it's not going to tell you this is how you put something into a MARC record. Um, you can use MARC records and that's fine, but it doesn't prescribe any of that. So LRM has four elements. Um, it has the user tasks, which are the find, identify, select, and obtain. And then they added explore, which I think is great because we all know that um, wonder, wonderful um, serendipitous feeling of, say, going to look for a particular book on, say, quilts or crocheting, and I wouldn't know anything about that, um, and finding all the books on the shelf next to it, you know, and being able to kind of explore. Um, what else is there? You're like, oh, I had no idea they had this many quilting books, and here they are. Um, it has the entities. So again, you know, the people, the works, the manifestations, the concepts, the time, the places, all of those things. Um, the entities have attributes that describe them. And then there's the relationships between the entities and each other. So, <clears throat> oh, sorry. So entities are things that we deal with in bibliographic description. So anything that, you know, anything that we can describe bibli bibliographically um, can be described as an entity, um, except for fictitious people, but that's a whole different thing. We'll get to that. Um, so the entities are the actual framework of the model. And the relationships then connect those entities to each other. So this is, it's still an entity relationship model. It still works the same way. Um, in the, the library reference model, the highest level entity is called res, which literally in Latin means thing. So it's just a thing. It's anything that you can think of. So it can be a physical thing, uh, you know, an actual object like a person or a cup or a desk or a chair, but it can also be a philosophical concept like capitalism. Um, you know, it can be, I mean, it literally is anything that you could possibly imagine that has, you know, has something to do with bibliographic description in some sort of way. You know, it's, it's when you think about the universe of things that are out there as, as, catalogers we only deal with the subset that's actually you know is in the books or the resources that we're dealing with um so it isn't you know if it becomes if, if it becomes an entity that's um in a bibliographic resource in some sort of way then we deal with it that's a little bit of a philosophy thing so um but um, the relationships are going to connect these entities to each other. And then there's attributes that describe the entities. So in this, you know, in this case, you might have, um, you know, a rest is a thing. And the highest level relationship is, is sort of it has appellation. Appellation. It's called something. So we have a thing, a cup, you know, sort of in its platonic ideal. And what do we call it? We call it binomen, which in Latin literally means name, and we call it a cup. <laughs> so this thing that I'm holding in my hand here, um, if you can see me, has appellation cup, has a name, and I could it could it could have another name too. I could call it you know uh, coffee cup, or I could call it uh, 
paper cup or you know all sorts of other things um and then that that name has an attribute so if the name say you know say it's the name is you know say our thing is dostoevsky um the author so russian author who wrote brothers karamazov is our thing he has a appellation dostoevsky and then that name has attributes so it's in russian it could be written in cyrillic um and it could be in the national name authority file he could have the name Dostoevsky written out, transcribed in English, in which case the language would be English, the script would be Roman, and it would be, maybe it's in VIAF instead. So the international authority file. Um, so that's kind of how that particular model or relationships fit together in the library reference model. So in the library reference model, this is the whole model. Basically, I mean, these are these are all of the entities that there are. You can see it's extremely simple. So you have the top level REST, which is literally anything you could possibly imagine in the entire world that has something to do with a bibliographic resource. So pretty much anything you can think of, because somebody's probably written a book about it somewhere. The second level, so all of these are sub classes of REST. So they're subclasses of the thing. So here's our WEMI. Here's our agent. So an agent is a person or persons responsible for the creation of something. And that in the library reference model is broken down either into an individual person or a collective agent, which can be a corporate body, a family, you know, a conference, anything like that. Um, a nomen, which is literally the names that describe the thing, a place or a time span. And that's basically the whole, that's all of the entities that are in the model, that's it. It's just that those 13 and there you know, aren't any more. Everything that's on the same level is of equal importance. So it's, you know, an agent is not important, more important than a work, a work is not more important than the agent. So this is a little different than AACR2 where we always talked about like main entry, um, you know, or something like that with the idea that that's the, like the author's main entry, that's the most important thing. In this model, if you're all on the same level, you're all of equal importance. The other thing to be aware of is that in the library re reference model, it's very clear that an agent has to be a real person and it has to be a human person. Um, so we'll talk a little bit later about the implications of that for things like animals or pseudonyms or all of that good stuff that we as bibli bibliographic people who wrestle with bibli bibliographic data have to deal with. Um, that was a little bit of a work around. And that was what I was in charge of. <laughs> Yay me. Um, so attributes describe or characterize those entities. You don't have to have any attributes for any entities in the model. You don't have to describe them at all. But it says they may be recorded if applicable and easily ascertainable. So for example, a birth, a date of birth is an attribute of a person. If you have it, you can stick it in. Great. If you don't have it, it's fine. You know, it's like you can take or leave the information or the attributes that you want to attach to any particular entity. It's up to you. It's, you know, how complex do you want to be? You know, I'm a NACO cataloger. So if I'm making a name authority record, I tend to want to be as relatively complete as possible without spending hours or driving myself crazy. So I put as much information in as, in as I can. If you're simply cataloging a book, an obscure book by a person who wrote thing one one th who wrote one thing one time, and who has a unique name that probably isn't going to going to conflict with something else in the catalog, you may not record anything. You're just going to record the name and move on because you know you don't have time to deal with it. And I do that even as an eco cataloger. I do that all the time. Um, the attributes listed in the library reference model are what they call, they're not exhaustive and they're not because again, the library reference model is meant to be a really high level model. So they don't tend to have a whole lot of, um, of attributes that are listed actually in the LRM itself. 
But applications, so RDA, for example, which is an application of the library reference model, has many, many more attributes. So RDA has identified many, many more ways that you can describe an ent you know, particular entities. Um, and that's on purpose. You know, the, the, like I said, the library reference model left it very open for different applications to apply what they needed to for each of their communities. So um, RDA, which is used by libraries, you know, is gonna have a lot of attributes that are useful for us to have when we catalog, you know, books and materials for libraries. If a museum uses it, they may have a whole different set of attributes that they need to talk about, you know, things like medium or, um, you know, you know, kind of a surface that the artwork is on or something like that. Um, so they can have different attributes depending on, you know, their particular needs. So again, it's, it's meant to be broad on purpose. So the relationships connect these entities and provide context um, because in a lot of in a lot of ways, it's only until we have a, a thing has a relationship with something else that we understand what it is. Um, applications can expand on these relationships. Again, the library reference model has a very basic set um, and they can expand those depending on what kind of relationships they need or how fine and granularity they need to make the relationships. So for example, you know, um, the library reference model may, may have, you know, entity one is the creator of entity two, and that might be as far as they go. Under RDA, under is the creator of, there could be all sorts of sub relationships like is the corporate author of, is the author of, is the family author of, is the conference author of, you know, so you can expand on that as you need to within your own implementation. And so in RDA, it's going to expand on a lot of those relationships to be more precise and not so general. All relationships are, ref are a refinement of the top level relationship, with the, which is that res thing is associated with another thing. And that's like, that's basically like the most generic thing that you can say is you can say that, you know, this thing is somehow associated with this other thing, you know, without specifying what the association is. And every other relationship is a refinement or a more precise way of defining what that relationship is. The relationships between the WEMI um, entities are the core of the model, but um, as the library reference model folks say, implementation of further relationships is encouraged. So basically they're like, have at it, you know. Um, WEMI is sort of the core of it. Um, we're not gonna tell you how to implement this, but we encourage you to go out and make as many relationships as you need to. You also need to be aware that um, just like in logic models that um, you can take shortcuts. So we all know that like, you know, A equals B, B equals C, therefore A equals C. And this kind of works the same way. So you can say nomen one is an application, is a, is, you know, the, is an appellation of res. Res has appellation nomen two. So therefore nomen one equals nomen, nomen two. So there are there are shortcuts kind of built in. So you don't have to necessarily like, you know, write out the whole string of relationships to get down. So the library reference model in RD, R, R, RDA, sorry, um, is, so now you're like, you know, so why are we talking about this? Well, it's important to know because RDA is the new RDA is an implementation of this library reference model. Um, so that's sort of the underlying basis of the whole thing. Um, it is and will be and will continue to be what's called an instance or an instantiation of the library reference model, which basically means that it can expand on the, on the model, but it has to follow the rules of the model that, there's, that are set out in LRM. It can't, it has to work under the rules that are set up. So for example, the library reference model says agents have to be people. So in order to be an instance of the library reference model, RDA can all, can't basically come along and say, okay, well, we're ignoring that and agents can be people. If that's, don't have to be people, they can be animals or fictitious people or whatever. If they do that, it's no longer an instance of the LRM. So it has to follow the basic rules that are set out in that model. 
it's gonna it's a, it adapts the library reference model and expands on it again while keeping to those keeping to those rules and those underlying the underlying structure that's there um the three R project is trying to aim for compatibility between the current entities that are in RDA and the library reference model. So the three R project was about reconciling um, what we already do with the new library reference model and basically making those pieces fit together. And some of the things that weren't talked about or were undeveloped, like concept, place, you know, concept and time span that were kind of placeholders in RDA and weren't really gotten to where it said, you know, this will be further developed and then it was never further developed are now being developed. <laughs> so, so those are actually finally being um, addressed aggregates, which are, um, we'll talk about, which I think are the hardest thing probably to get your brain around in RDA, um, which include things like serials, um, you know, and multi, um, multi, uh, what am I trying to sort of multi volume works, things like that um, are also being addressed because um, serials is kind of a mess. And I will have the disclaimer, I am not a serials cataloger. Um, so that is a, I have problems understanding that because it's a mystery to me. So where we are now, I think where we are now is we should take a five minute break. <laughs> Joy, if that's okay with you, and let everybody sit up and stretch and um, get a drink of water. And does that sound like a plan? Sounds good to me. Okay, so I have 1053, so let's say five minutes and we'll readjourn. Okay, and I will pause the recording. Okay, and I hope y'all aren't asleep by now. <laughs> Thank you, nice lady telling me the recordings in progress. I always love her recording in progress. Thank you. Okay, so the RDA toolkit and the library reference model. So the new one. So remember that RDA is what's called an instance or an instantiation of the of the library reference model. So that means that it's it's an exemplar of that. It it takes that as its basis. And um, so it starts with the library reference model, but then as encouraged by the library reference model, it expands on all of that. So um, there are refinements and um, there are sort of additional attributes and things that aren't necessarily, um, that aren't in the library reference model, again, because it's meant to be sort of a very general, you know, sort of, um, overview or umbrella um, for everything that's going to come underneath of it. So the elements or the attributes, um, RDA elements are what the library reference model calls um, attributes, are refinements of the library reference model. So um, the attributes that are identified by the library reference model are then broken down into further sort of more granular um, classes and RDA uses those. So it's like you can be much more specific about the relationships or about the attributes that describe something than just, you know, like name, you know, you can have different kinds of names. Um, the RDA toolkit um, retains all the elements of the LRM. Um, so, you know, WEMI and person are in there and then it adds a few additional elements. Um, or entities that are subclasses of that. So agent, collective agent, nomen, place, time span, and RDA entity. And we're gonna talk about those. So, um, so hang on. Um, so the structure of RDA, it inherits um, the user task sort of emphasis of the library reference model. So um, the new RDA sort of makes sure that um, each thing that we're describing carries back to a specific user task. Um, you know, it's like we do this because this um, satisfies um, this user task, you know, trying to identify or trying to find or trying to select. The structure is different um, in the new RDA. So instead of having the old one, which, you know, started with like man describing manifestations and items and then describing works and expressions, um, each section, the general guidance that used to be there is now all merged together into one big guidance section of RDA. 
And there's a user task section that tells you again, like what part of RDA is satisfying what user task. There's much, much more catalog adjustment, which my students and everyone else hates to hear. Um, a lot of RDA is just options. And so which option you choose to apply is going to depend on your cataloging agency and to a certain extent on um, sort of what they're calling your library community. In this case, for most of us, that's gonna be the Library of Congress. And we'll get into a little bit later sort of what they're doing to kind of help this process along. Um, RDA focus, focuses again on the relationship between the data that's in a bibliographic record and the user task that we're trying to satisfy. Um, the sections in the chapters, rather than being things like, um, well, RDA, I guess the earlier RDA did this a little better too, but um, sections and chapters are actually broken up into individual data elements. So you no longer have like a chapter on like describing manifestations. It's it's actually each data element has its own page. And the whole thing, of course, is realigned to the, RL, the LRM entities and the sub entities that um, RDA has divided things into. Um, this actually sort of nice um, synopsis came from Chris Oliver's book, Intro Introducing RDA, A Guide to the Basics After 3R. It just came out. I would highly recommend this book for anyone who's thinking of working with the new RDA toolkit. It's like 40 bucks, it's not really expensive. Chris Oliver is lovely because she takes all of the, um, just like she did, um, I don't know how many people read her book when the first RDA came out, but she takes all of the jargon and everything and explains it in like English terms that everybody can understand. She's a whiz. Um, and a lovely person. Um, so I would, you know, I would for your cataloging agency, you know, your your technical services department, I would highly recommend that book because um, it puts all of this into sort of understandable language. And I'm not getting paid or anything. <laughs> so this is the front page of the RDA toolkit. And so all the guidance is gonna be under this guidance section here, this little tab. And so you can you can find guidance on like you know particular topics, and then there's sort of a whole general um, introduction. So some of this guidance, like guidance for aggregates, used to be like at the beginning of like when you went to the chapter on serials, you know, it would tell you how to do it, um, you know, or recording methods, you know, for each section, it would say, you know, here's some general information on recording a manifestation. And so now all of that is put together under this sort of. Um, big umbrella. So you can always, you know, you're like, well, I don't know what to do with a manifestation statement. You can come here and get guidance on that. Um, okay. So RDA, and I'm calling it RDA new flavor, RDA new flavor terminology. Um, so some things to be aware of, because you're going to read stuff and go, what does this mean? So one of the things they talk about is a metadata description set. What is that? That's a record. <laughs> um, the problem that we ran into, and we ran into um, in the RSC Plus meetings that I was in, was that you can't really think about records as records anymore. Um, for one thing, with the whole bib frame and the and the idea of um, the hopefully sort of end product, if we ever get there is gonna be that you're gonna have different um, entities and different elements and different pieces. So the work information, so for say like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, you would have a work record that would just have Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Lewis Carroll's access point. And then the expression would be a separate bit and then the manifestation would be a separate bit. And so you would put all of those things together to make one of these metadata description sets. So it's kind of mix and match. And it's also because the way that RDA is now um, organized, since it's organized not in sort of larger chunks, but each data element is its own thing. Um, all of those sort of metadata statements together are what make up what we would used to call a record. And so we're not calling it a metadata, metadata description sets. I'm trying to remember, we 
I think we used to call them chunks. <laughs> we didn't really, it was one of those things where it's like, we weren't supposed to think in Mark and we weren't supposed to, you know, we had to kind of think about it in sort of a new way. And so in RSC plus meetings, it was always like, it's like, don't call it a record. So it's like, okay, what do we call it? So I guess they've sort of settled on this metadata description sets. Um, so what, what it officially is, is if you look in the glossary, it's one or more metadata statements that describe and relate individual instances of one or more RDA ent entities. So what does that mean? Um, so an RDA triple is a metadata statement. So for those of you who understand um, RDF, um, and it should be an RDF triple, it's also an RDA triple, but an R, um, so that's when you have one of these entity relationship and you know entity kind of things and i was helped to think of this as a sentence so the entity the subject is related to is the predicate and then the object so it's subject verb object if you want to think about it that way or entity relationship entity so in this case you have a subject the domain so terry pratchett who's a person in an rda entity he has date of birth that's the predicate or the verb and then the object is a time span, and that's his date of birth. So time, a time span can just be one date. It doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, you can basically take the span off and just say time, and it could be a span of time or a day or a minute or an hour or whatever, but a time. So a set of these together um, to combine to describe an entity is going to be a metadata description set. So for a work, you're going to say a work has author agent Terry Pratchett. So that's one metadata bit. And then a work has author agent Neil Gaiman. That's another bit. Work has title of work, good omens, yet another metadata bit. And so all of these together are what describe the thing. And it's so it's a set of metadata that describes a resource. So RDA entities, remember, um, that the library reference model had 13 and um, LRM has a couple of more because they've divided some things into classes, into some classes, into subclasses. So the top level entity in RDA, instead of being REST, which is thing, which is like any possible thing you could ever think of, um, the top level entity is RDA entities. So what that means is that um, every, RDA entity has to be defined in one of these subclasses. Um, so it's a little narrower than the library reference model. Because of this, um, subjects aren't really included because subjects aren't um, an entity in RDA. And that's OK, because that's sort of traditionally how we've cataloged anyway, where we, se we separate out resource description and access, you know, so the descriptive and access point parts of a cataloging record. I'm gonna call a record um, for shorthand because I don't wanna say metadata description set a million times. Um, record from, um, you know, AACR2 is always, you know, even from back in those days, it's always been about description and access and not subjects. Subjects have always been taken care of sort of in a side, you know, as a separate thing. And so this is kind of just continuing in that, in that tradition. Collective agent is divided into a corporate body and family. So that's a refinement. So in the library reference model, it's person or collective agent. And then in RDA, they divide the collective agent into a corporate body and family. And a corporate body can of course be a conference or an event or you know any of the other things that are defined as corporate bodies. Um, RDA entities are hierarchical. So there really is a hierarchy to it with superclasses and subclasses. If you want to think about it as sort of a taxonomy, you know, families and phyla and all that stuff. Um, subclasses take on all the attributes of superclasses or the class above it. So, um, you know, if there are attributes that apply to um, an agent, they're also going to apply to their subclasses of person and corporate body. It doesn't work the other way around. So you can have an attribute like date of birth that, that describes a person, but that isn't going to be applicable necessarily to the super class of agent because a corporate body is an agent too and it does not have a date of birth. So RDA actually specifically defines 
all of these. So, you know, author agent, you know, you can, so you can have a, a, an agent who acts as an author in the LRM, that's all you get. In RDA, they actually specifically define each, each one of those subclasses. So there's an author collective agent, an author who's a corporate body, an author who's a family, or an author who's a person. And that's why you get these kind of weird relationships that say things like author person of, <laughs> which just means it's an author that's a person or author family of, which means it's the author is a family, you know, so it, it kind of, it's kind of tagging what kind of author you're dealing with. So an RDA entity is, um, as it's defined in RDA, is an abstract class of physical or conceptual thing in the universe of human discourse. Yeah, what does that mean? Okay. <laughs> so basically, it's a, it's a thing that shows up in the stuff that we catalog some sort of way. So there's 13 entities in RDA. Um, and again, most come from the library reference model, but some are specific to RDA, like RDA entity. Most are carried over from the original toolkit. So the WEMI entries, work, expression, manifestation, and item we're familiar with. Um, agent, um, they use the word agent um, in the library reference model in part because when they wrote RDA the first time and they had to include a sort of umbrella term for creator people, they use the word agent as a shorthand and that kind of stuck. So agent is who's responsible basically. Um, and it has the subclasses of person and collection, collective agent, and then collective agent has the subclasses corporate body and family. And then the new entities in RDA include that RDA entity, so the, the top level entity, Nomen, which is, um, we'll get to, Nomen is, Nomen is a weird cat, um, but in order for the model to work, has to be, the model to work, it has to be there. Place and time span. And these are pretty, I mean, place is a geographic location and time span is a span of time. So those are pretty, those are pretty self-explanatory. So if you look in RDA and you look under the entities and the description, it's gonna say agent, an entity who is capable of deliberate actions of being granted rights and of being held accountable for its actions. An agent includes a collective agent and a person. Now be aware because this is an instance of the library reference model, an agent does have to be a human um, who is, how do they describe it? A human who has lived or to is assumed to have lived. Um, so that covers some like cases like patriarchs and stuff. You know, it's like Abraham's in the Bible. Did he live or is he just a mythical character? And you can kind of say, well, we assume he lived. So we'll just, we'll assume he's a person. Not that we have anything. I don't think we have any writings by Abraham. So it's not going to be an issue. <laughs> but, but anyway, I digress. Um, so when you look at an entity, it's going to tell you pre-recording. So these are sort of those things to think about before you start actually recording an entity of some sort. So it tells you this is a super type, which means it has subtypes. So it's a class and it has subclasses is another way to think about it. Um, for more specific description, use one of the following entity subtypes if suitable. So it's telling you this is divided up into collective agent, which is divided up into corporate body and family and also person. And so, and this gives you the hierarchy. So you can see the collective agent and person are on the same level and the corporate body and family are subclasses of this. And these entities are subtypes of this super type. For more, oops, for a more general description, use the entity super type RDA entity. So an RDA entity is just anything in RDA. You know, you're not, you don't, if you don't know if it's a corporate body or a person or a work, or you're like, I don't know what the heck it is, at the very least, it can be an entity. Um, you're not going to use that too often. Most of the time, we can figure out, you know, if it's a person or a place or a thing or whatever. So the entities are all listed, and this is my personal, you know, um, I, I, um, when you go in, if you subscribe to the toolkit, it's going to give your institution and then you can make your own profile, which is nice because you can um, you can basically tell RDA, like, what do I want to see and what do I not want to see? So it's like, I don't necessarily want to see 
policy statements from the Deutsche National Bibliothek because I don't really need to follow German cataloging guidance. I need to follow LC cataloging guidance. So that's a nice thing. And you can sign up to have your own sort of little, and it remembers all your like settings and nice stuff like that. So the entities, all the entities are listed here. So when you're cataloging, whatever you're interested in finding out about, you can just, you know, click on it and go look at the guidance and the sort of, um, I don't want to say rules, but sort of the, the definitions that are there. So the RDA entity, as we said, is the top level entity and replaces the rest or the thing in the library reference model. So this is the, I, I literally cut and paste the um, definition from the glossary here. So basically an RDA entity is any of those, um, any of those sub entities that are underneath it, like agent and WEMI and all of those things. The RDA entity only includes things that are RDA entities. So again, um, because agents, people are considered agents and ages, agents can only be humans. Things like um, what I like to call non-human personages. So anything that's a non-human, so if it's an, an animal, if it's a fictitious person, if it's a god, if it's an angel or anything like that, um, it's treated two separate ways in RDA. It's either treated just as a straight up pseudonym. So Geronimo Stilton, the mouse who writes the little children's books, he's just a pseudonym for whoever the author of the book is. Um, you know, Millie who wrote the book um, about being the White House dog is a pseudonym for Barbara Bush. Um, who probably had a ghostwriter, but she's still credited as author. Um, so those we just treat like normal pseudonyms. Um, so those are pretty easy. We get into problems when we have things like animal performers because technically under the library reference model, an animal performer can't be a creator. So they can't be a performer, even though clearly they are a performer. And this is, this is why I spent two years of having an intense headache when I was dealing with this stuff. Um, so there are ways around that <laughs> that we'll talk about. Um, but it, the, but in this case, uh, an animal performer like Asta from the Thin Man movies or Lassie or Coco the Gorilla, who is in her own documentary, but apparently doesn't exist um, as an entity in RDA, um, is it, would be considered an entity external to RDA. Um, subject headings are also, so subjects, are also external to RDA. And you can do that by using um, related entity of RDA entities. So basically you can say Coco is a related entity to the work that is the documentary on Coco. So that's, you know, it's basically just saying this entity has some sort of relationship to an RDA entity, so a work, but that's the most you can say about it. Um, again, subjects are out of scope for RDA. Um, you can use the, uh, the relationship subject element to relate a topic to an RDA entity, but the entity itself, so like, you know, if, if you have a book on, um, I don't motorcycles, motorcycle is going to be the subject and that's not really, that's not an RDA entity, it's a different entity, but you can relate entities outside of RDA to RDA entities by using a very generic relationship. All other of the 12 RDA entities are subtypes of this main RDA entity, which we saw in the hierarchy. So you have RDA entity, you'll see this looks very similar to the LRM one. Um, you have the work, you know, manifestation, all of, you know, all of those second levels. The agent, which just like the LRM is broken into person and collective agent. And then in RDA, they break down this collective agent into um, corporate bodies and families. And that's a lot of this is to um, accommodate both archival um, institutions and institutions that may have a lot of genealogical stuff because families obviously deposit papers and there are books written about families and you know stuff like that. So that was added. So some of these new entities, um, Nomen is one of them, which like I said, literally means name. This is, this is a difficult concept to get your brain around. Um, I will say that right from the bat. It's sort of a philosophical construct, but it's necessary in order for the model to work. <laughs> so um, it's useful for authority control. 
basically, and for managing identities for the most part. Um, nomen literally means name in Latin. And the reason they use nomen instead of name is because name in, um, in English, and certainly when it's translated into other languages, has very specific connotations. Um, because a nomen can be a name, like Amanda is a name, or Shelley is a name, or, you know, Joy is a name, those are names. Um, but a nomen can also be um, like my ORCID identification number can be a name, my social security number can be a nomen. Um, you know, um, a reference to my website that identifies me may be a kind of nomen for me. So it doesn't necessarily have to be what we think of as a name, like something you would call someone. You know, you wouldn't call someone, hey, ORCID number, you know, 000004. Um, but it is a nomen. And so that's sort of why they've, they've stuck with the Latin terminology. Um, besides being an attribute or sort of describing the RDA entity of a person or a thing or whatever, um, it's also an entity in itself. So a nomen can have relationships to other nomen. Um, and this is important in authority work where um, people may have different nomens and you want to associate them together. So the nomen string, so the actual characters or numbers or whatever that make up the nomen is called the nomen string. And it can be any combination of letters, symbols, numbers, characters, signs, whatever. You know, when Prince for a while protesting changed his name to that weird symbol, um, that weird Prince symbol is, an, is a nomen string. So it's a nomen for Prince. Um, and the same nomen string can refer to different nomens. So the way to think about this is a nomen is, is a, um, is a name or an identifier that um, identifies a very particular um, being. So for me, <coughs> for me, my no nomen is me, you know, I'm the person. The nomen strings, and I have nomens, I have names. And those, no those nomen strings, those nomens are identified by strings and they those strings may be um, Amanda, A-M-A-N-D-A, -A that's a nomen string. They may be Mandy, M-A-N-D-E-Y, although no one's called me that since I was four. Um, it may be just the initial A, which is what my family calls me. So those are all nomen strings that identify um, nomen that I am known by. So Paul Simon, the nomen string Paul Simon, um, can indicate the nomen for the former Illinois senator, but it can also be the nomen for Paul Simon, the singer-songwriter. So you need to understand the context um, that it's in in order to understand, you know, which particular Paul Simon you're talking about. And you can see how in th authority work this becomes important. Um, the appellation element, so, you know, has appellation whatever is what relates a nomen to an RDA entity, to an agent or to a corporate body or a work, because works have nomens as well. The title is a, no, is a kind of nomen. So the nomen for this guy, the guy who wrote Carrie, The Stand, Rita Hayworth, and The Shawshank Production, Stephen King is his name. If we're just going to use non, if, we're, if we go outside of RDA and just go into real life, his name is Stephen King. In RDA, this guy has an appellation of nomen A, B, C, D, and E. So he's known by all of these different nomens. The nomen strings that identify nomen A is Stephen King. The nomen string that identifies nomen B is Stephen Edwin King. Oops, sorry. The nomen that the nomen string that identifies nomen C, it's his authorized access point, is King, comma Stephen, 1947, two. The nomen string that identifies nomen D is his name in Cyrillic, so what he's known, and known as in Russia. And then nomen E is represented by this nomen string with his date of birth, which is his name in Hebrew. Now, nomens can also have their own attributes. So nomen E has the attribute nomen string, which is this. It has scriptive nomen attribute, which means it's in Hebrew. It has the language of the nomen, which is his name in Hebrew. And it has, um, it's uh, 
in this case, it's um, what do they call this context, nomen context of use, he writes horror fiction. So these are all attributes of nomen D E. So I hope that makes some sort of sense. <laughs> um, like, like I said, nomen is sort of is a construct. And um, in order to be able to relate things properly to each other in RDA, uh, it has to it has to be there in the library reference model. Um, it's not it's not going to be it's something that's sort of in the background for the most part, and that you're unless you're doing authority work, you're probably not going to be actively having to think about it too much. It's mostly just sort of it mostly models out the sort of intuitive relationships that are already there that we think about when we think about authorities and people's names and that sort of thing. So nomen appellations are relationship elements that link the nomen to their nomen string. So the top level or the highest sort of most generic thing you can have is, you know, nomen string is appellate, you know, nomen is appellation of an RDA entity. So, you know, um, Stephen King is appellation of, you know, person, Stephen King, whatever. <coughs> and then there's a whole bunch of sub elements that you can have. So you can have a preferred name, a preferred title for a book, um, you know, an access point for, so that's going to be, you know, Stephen King's, you know, actual um, authority record access point or authorized access point. Um, you know, variant names of entities. So there's all sorts of sort of sub sub attributes and sub elements that you can use. And again, these are all implied in the R, R, LRM model, but um, RDA actually makes them explicit and writes them all out. Um, place and time span, like I said, is pretty self-explanatory. Place is defined by RDA as a given extent of space, it's basically a location. Um, so it can be, you know, it can be a city or a state or an area or a national park or, a, you know, um, or an ocean or, you know, basically any of the geographic things, you know, we think of. Um, there is something about fictitious places, but off the top of my head, I can't remember. It's not talked about too much and I can't, it's, it sort of goes in with fictitious bodies. So you would have to relate a fictitious place to um an entity by just that you know that very top level like outside of rda relationship um a time span is a finite period of time and so it can either be a span or it can just be a year or it can be a particular date you know whatever um it can be an, an era like the Res renaissance so you can talk about it in terms of that or a decade um, in the old toolkit, the time or time span was the attribute of an entity, and now it's its own entity, so you can actually relate it to another entity by a relationship. If it was just an attribute, you would just, you wouldn't really be able to use these different sort of um, relationships, but now you can say like, Helen Stocker has date of birth, so that's the relationship, and then has the time span, 1860. 1869 and you can have you know time span is the date of birth of which is a relationship Helen Stalker so that's why it's 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 as an entity you can use those sort of um, relationships to describe them so the RDA elements um, RDA uses the word element to basically refer to attributes so basically information about the RDA elements or about the RDA entities um, the library reference model only had like 30 of these attributes or something, maybe 60, I don't know, it's it's less than 100. RDA has an element set of over 3000 elements or attributes. So there are 3000 ways that you can describe things in RDA. Um, so it's a lot. <laughs> the reason they did this is because um, recording data in sort of defined unambiguous elements um, has kind of been the goal of RDA since it was introduced. And this is because we want machines to be able to deal with this data and they don't do well with, um, like right now a publication statement that we have in, in Mark is like three things glommed together and machines don't do well with that. They want very discreet, like short, you know, um, things to deal with. 
Um, so in RDA, the elements are really precisely defined and they don't overlap. So it means that each element contains only one kind of data. And the instructions that you're going to find for many of the elements um, recommend using a controlled vocabulary or what we now call a vocabulary encoding scheme, because again, machines can refer and deal with that. Um, so that's one of the reasons we want to use controlled vocabularies as much as possible. Um, each element is fairly granular, so it's broken down into pretty small chunks um, so that it's really clear what kind of data is in the, gonna be in that element. Um, it, by doing this, it really it decreases ambiguity when you have two things that might refer to the same sort of thing or have the same, you know, like if you have space meaning outer space and space meaning space and say like architecture, which are two separate concepts. Um, and of course it doesn't deal with subjects, but it breaks, it would break that down um, so that it would be clear which one you were talking about. Um, and it also helps increase um, reliability if you have large collections of you know data that you're trying to go through. So some of that, um, you know, not getting the three million hits when you type in something in Google problem, um, you know, it it refines, it can help with refining and limiting searches to what your people are actually looking for. Um, so some rules in RDA, each element's unique and each element only describes one entity. So it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Each element has one or more alternate labels and it's it's um, often edifying to look at those because sometimes the elements are, seem rather opaque and cryptic as to what they actually mean. And sometimes when you look at the alternate able, it's an actually English, it's actually in English. And you can go, oh, okay, that's what it is. Um, an element carries information about the entity. So again, this is what the LRM would refer to as an attribute. Um, except in RDA, it can be a characteristic, an attribute, or a relationship. So relationships are also elements. Um, in RDA, all of the elements that refer to an entity are on that entity page. So when you go to the bottom of the page for say person, it's gonna give you a list of all the possible elements that you can use to describe that person. One thing to get comfortable with I, that I find very helpful is to understand the difference between domain and range. So domain, is the entity that's described by an element. So the person or the corporate body or whatever. And the range is the value of that. So you can say that, um, you know, if the element is something like um, author person of, the domain is gonna be person because a person is the author person of, and then the range you're looking for is gonna be a work. Okay, so that helps you figure out what the subject and what the object is in those those sort of metadata sentences that we're putting together. If the element's an attribute, it only has a domain. And that's usually when it's something like, you know, has date of birth, whatever, you know, except in that case, now it's a time span. So that is an entity. Anyway, we'll see an example of that. So here's author person. <laughs> which I love, which just means author. Um, and you can go down and just say, say alternate label has author person. And so this will tell you that um, the domain is a work. So when you're, when you're dealing with a work and you wanna relate an author to it, you're gonna use this. So the domain is work, has author person, and then the range is person. So you're gonna to wanna to have a name there. That helps you figure out which way these are going. Cause sometimes there's like multiple ofs and it's very difficult to understand like what the element, I get confused sometimes on which way it's going. You know, is it like, is, is author person, person is author person of this or, you know, <laughs> it can get confusing. So this helps you figure out which way you're going. Um, when you look up and click on this um, element reference, um, it gives you um, the domain and the range, the alternate labels, and then it'll tell you which fields this um, is actually connected with in MARC, in Dublin Core, and in the LRM. 
And I assume at some point, you know, if there's more metadata schemas that come in, they'll be, you'll be able to expand these and look at that too. So this tells you um, where is this defined? It's defined in um, Mark 21 authority files in the 500 fields to relate a work to the author of the work. And in bibliographic um, records, it goes into these fields. So you can have an unstructured description, a note that says, you know, so-and-so is the author of this. Usually we're gonna put it in some kind of 100 or 700 field. So it tells you basically, you know, where you can put that information, which is very handy. So basically if you have a work, um, so that's the domain. So this work is The Master and Margarita, just one of my favorite books. And the relationship element is author person. The range, so work, author person, and the person is going to be Mikhail Bulgakov. In this case, that's his authorized heading. So the domain is the work and it's looking for, so basically it wants, this relationship element wants you to fill in a person's name the range. So in this case, person, Mikhail um, Bulgakov has the profession, and this is an attribute of writer, because writer isn't an RDA element. And there's not a and it's not a relationship. So it's just an attribute. So it's in this case, there's no range because you can say domain person and then describe that person in a whole lot of different ways. So in this case, profession is just looking for, you know, a word or something. So all the possible elements that you can have for an entity are listed at the bottom. And you can divide them into, if you just want to see attributes, you can do that. If you just want to see relationship elements, you can do that. Or you can look at all of them. So if you click on these, like a bridger person of, it'll give you a definition. And if you click on this little arrow dealy with the page, it'll take you to the page that describes that element. So it's nice. It's taking full advantage of, um, of you know of web technology and of how websites work rather than i think the old rda was still pretty much sort of in the you know transfer a book to a digital document this is actually a fully linked digital document you can go back and forth and look things up it's it's the links are really nice so um there's some new important elements to keep in mind there's a manifestation statement which is um basically a way to graphically represent what's actually on the title page and you transcribe it and people are like well why do we need that um for a couple of reasons um it's mostly for machine transcription so if things are ocr'd and you know sometimes it if the title's in all caps it'll show up in all caps or whatever it it basically allows you to record that without having to go in and change the capitalization and punctuation on it on everything it's also for good enough um descriptions of stuff that if you need to just like ingest a whole bunch of stuff you know quickly without having to worry about changing it into the correct case and doing all that stuff you can do it and it's also really good for early printed resources where um, the difference between editions might be something as small as there is a period or isn't a period somewhere so for terry pratchett for example if you're going to do a manifestation title and responsibility statement you're going to put it with all the capitals and the registered trademark and exactly as it shows up and the same thing with if you're going to do the publication statement. So if you were going to do a full manifestation statement for the title page, it's going to be transcribed exactly. And then you divide up elements with this double backsplash or backslash. You do tighten up um, white space so you don't bother to indicate that there's like however many lines of white space or whatever. You don't worry about that. The toolkit has guidance for how to transcribe these. Um, in the section under guidance. Um, there is a problem right now with mark because you can only do this in sub elements. Um, you can't, you know, we don't have a 245 that shows like the whole, you know, the whole um, title page is one big long string. You know, the 245 is actually broken up into sub elements. So you can't do this whole long, you know, this whole long sort of manifestation statement. Um, and I don't know why you can't, I, I, 
now that I think about it, I guess you could put it in a 246, but maybe, I don't know if you can. Anyway, that's that's one of the issues. There's no place right now in Mark to stick this. There's no field for that. A representative expression um, came about as a new element or an, because um, in current RDA, language or content type are expression elements. In the past, they've been kind of held in the work with the work. Um, and in the new flavor RDA, um, things like language content and um, intended audience are all in the expression, which makes sense if you think about it, because Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, you know, could be a children's story, but then it could also be, you know, certain expressions of that could be intended for adults, you know, maybe you have a, maybe somebody does a wild, you know, like erotic pictures to go with Alison's and Wonderlands or something, which would definitely not be for children. Um, so that would be a different expression. So these had to move kind of somewhere out of the work element. Um, and what it basically is, it's, it's sort of, think about it as the original expression of a work. It's easiest to think about in music. So the representation, the representative expression is going to be, um, say, the original key a work was in, you know, not transposed, you know, that has the original or you know orchestration. Um, it's going to be a novel in its original language, or a map in its original projection, um, and and things can have more than one representative expression. So, for example, um, you know, if the subject is the work and it has a representative expression of an expression, you can have Alice in Wonderland has the representative expression, the 1865 language text, because this was the or text. This was the ori original, it was a book in text, it came out in English. So uh, hypothetically, the access point for the expression would be Lewis Carroll says Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So this is the work. And then the representative expression would be the 1865 English version. Now we don't have these in Mark right now, obviously. This is all like theoretically thinking about it for the future. So Wicked, for example, can have more than one represent representative expression because you can have the score, the original notated music, and then you can have the original cast recording, which is gonna be a representative expression for the cast recording you know and this is a way to relate um, different expressions together you know to kind of say that you know this is the work and that it has these two representative expressions and then you know the notated music can have different manifestations it can have um, it can have uh, music that's published by one publishing firm and then is republished by another publishing firm or something like that. And so this is how you would divide these up into sort of their, you know, like this is the work record, this is the expression record. And from that you can add the, uh, you can add the manifestation records as needed. Hey, Amanda, yep. can I interrupt you with yep. some questions from the oh, chat? Oh, sure. And, I, and we're, uh, we're running. I knew we were going to run long, so I'm sorry mm -hmm. about that. I mean, I'm that's happy okay. to talk as long as you guys want to hang out, but <laughs> if you have to go, that's fine. So the first question is, how do pseudonym, pseudonyms fit? Like Stephen King, Richard yeah. Bachman. Um, we're going to get think, to that. Okay. <laughs> we're not there yet. Um, and then uh, second question, would all the representative expressions be entered in the same record? And They've, then that was clarified, same yes, authority record. They should, they, sh they should be, I mean, we don't have any way to do this right now, but theoretically you would have a work record and all the representation expressions for that work would be on that same record. And then there would be individual records for each of those representative expressions as well. Does that make sense? So it would be kind of like the roll-up model that a lot of packs are moving toward now, uh, but like the catalog version of that. Yeah, probably. I don't. I'm. I do not deal with the front end like at all. So I'm really bad to talk about like web pack what web packs are doing. But yeah, it's because the idea is sort of the difference between a flat mark record and sort of a three-dimensional 
more bib frame type record where you pull different bits together to make the data set for that record that you want. So you would, you know, you would pull like the work record. If you had a manifestation of Allison, Allison in Wonder, Alice in Wonderland, you'd pull the work record, the expression record for that manifestation, the manifestation all together into one record. Does that make sense? No, yes. Yes, yes, Maybe. it does. Okay, okay, cool. Any other questions? Nothing okay. in the chat right now. Okay, Thank cool. You. So the way to, the other new way of thinking about um, another new thing in RDA is how you record things. And Gordon Dunsire, who was the chair of RC at the time, um, liked to call this the fourfold path. It sounds very zen. Um, but basically it says there's four ways that you can record data. You can use an unstructured description, dis description which think of it just as a note, just as a free text note. You can use a structured description. So that's going to be something like um, an authorized access point or something like the 336, 337, 338 that have structured language and um, encoding and like an actual vocabulary that you use for that. You can use an identifier, which could be an ISBN or an ORCID or a music publisher number, anything like that. And then the fourth way is to actually use a link, um, you know, a literal like an IRI that uniquely identifies that thing in a particular encoding scheme. So there's four ways that you can sort of identify data. So why are they doing this? Um, again, because there's different databases and different implementations. It, enco it encompasses flat files of so card catalogs, which use a lot of unstructured or very loosely structured information. Um, you can record data so that it, you can use linked authorized access points between authorities and BIB records. It works in relational or um, object databases. And then on a global level, if you're using IRIs, you can actually have linked data. So where you know you might mention Lewis Carroll and by using that IRI you can pull like all sorts of other information about Lewis Carroll up that are linked to Lewis Carroll. So there's there's four different ways for each element that you can um, that you can do that. And since I kind of explained this, I'm gonna since we're running low on time. So for example, um, the good, the bad and the ugly, um, you know, this is kind of how it looks on the, um, on the, and I know normally we would use the title frame, but I'm going to use the cover, just ignore the fact I'm breaking the rules. Um, so you would use modified transcription on that, which is fine. You know, you're going to put in your own punctuation and you're not going to, you know, capitalize and do all that stuff. But basically it's just, you know, you're going to just record what's on there in an unstructured you know, 245. A structured description, again, is going to be like an authorized access point where you're actually getting something from um, a vocabulary encoding scheme, you know, so we used to call these just like, you know, when you actually look up like a term in a, in a, in a thesaurus that you're using like a AAT or Library of Congress subject headings, those are all vocabulary encoding schemes. Identifiers, you know, usually are some kind of, you know, number or something that's um, assigned by an agency to help with identification. So they can be music publishing numbers or record numbers. They can be ISNIs, which are um, sort of like ISBNs for people. Um, they can be, you know, a, a, a number and an authority from an authority file or an ISBN. So they're basically just, you know, numbers or other kinds of labels that are assigned to um, to something. And then IRIs are are they're called literals because they're actually the thing themselves. So a literal or an IRI for Jenny Lawson is going to be this. Um, authorities names and this is her authority record on the end so this this represents jenny lawson and only jenny lawson and a computer can read this and make sense of this because it can go to the vocabulary that's published and figure out that that's what it is um 
the Library of Congress Music or Performance term thesaurus. Um, this is the IRI it gives for the oboe. And then um, this last one, um, which I can't read because it has it's my thing is over is over it. Um, oh, the Marco list for language. So it's, you know, this is going to be English language. I think I used English. <laughs> I have my stop sharing screen sharing thing that I can't move. So I don't get to see the bottom of my slide. Um, so how this works, if you're using linked data, is you link Jenny Lawson's IRI to, oops, to her book IRI. In this case, it's from um, Open Library, the title in Open Library, by a relationship that also has an IRI. And the thing is, is that the computer can figure all these links out by itself. So it's not using strings. You don't have the problem of not exactly matching strings and stuff. And the com computer can figure out that, oh, Jenny Lawson is the author of this book. So that's a way that the computer can make sense of it. It also means that the computer then can link Jenny Lawson to other things out there in the world that use these same IRIs. Okay, aggregates, my least favorite thing to talk about. Um, basically, these are serials and other things that are kind of stuffed glommed together. This is very, very messy in RDA. So what is an aggregate? Um, the definition is an aggregate is manifestation that embodies an aggregating expression and one or more expressions that are aggregated. The expressions that are aggregated may realize one or more works. An aggregate embodies one and only one aggregating expression. An aggregate may be issued in one or more units. That makes complete sense, right? Yeah, no, I know. It makes no sense at all. <laughs> so basically, there's three kinds of aggregates. There's a collection, an augmenta augmentation, or a parallel aggregate. aggregate. A collection aggregate is a manifestation, so resource, that has two or more expressions of two or more works. So basically, it's, it's, it's a book that has separate works in it that are all glommed together in that book. So a compilation of short stories, um, a book that has chapters written by individual people, an album of folk songs where each song is its own work, and then it aggregates all those together, an anthology of poems. So a collection of stuff. So all of these sorts of things are aggregates. And for journals, an aggregate can either be the whole set of journals. So the whole run of Scientific American, that's one kind of aggregate. And then a journal itself, issue itself is an aggregate because it aggregates all the individual articles in that one issue of the journal. An augmentation aggregate is basically when you have a main work and you have other stuff glommed onto that. So if you have a novel that has a foreword and illustrations and an index, all of those things are glommed onto the text, which is one work. Um, a CD that has a software program, but also has accompanying material like a book with it. Um, a DVD with a film and bonus material. So all these have sort of a main, what we think of as sort of the main thing and then other extra things stuck on it. Um, so that's what an augmentation aggregate is. And then a parallel aggregate is a manifestation that has two or more expressions of a single work. So they're basically like the most common thing is a bilingual edition. So a bilingual government documents, like in Canada, a lot of documents come out that have English and French, for example. Um, if you have a CD product manual or you get a um, you get instructions and you know, like I just got a webcam and it had instructions in like 10 different languages. So that would be a parallel aggregate. Um, a website that has multiple languages or um, books that are in original translation that have a line by line um, that have the original language and a line by line translation with them. So these are all sort of, you know, examples of that. So you have a vocal score with French and English. Um, the Biblioteca Nacional in um, Brazil is this is the English language one, but you can see it also has, it can be in Portuguese or Spanish. Um, this is Baudelaire Fleur de Mal, which has side by side English and French translations. 
So those are parallel aggregates. And then augmentation aggregates, again, are going to be just stuff that has added things on them. So Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, has a foreword by Cornel West. So the main work is The New Jim Crow, and it has, it has this foreword that augments the work in some sort of way, sort of the extra added bonus that comes with it. The thing to understand about this is that the aggregate manifestation, so this is the book that has all the, say, book chapters in it. This aggregates in one expression, which aggregates one work. So this manifestation, this is the work, that's the book that has all the chapters in it. It has one expression and it has one aggregate manifestation. Now the aggregate manifestation has a bunch of different aggregated expressions for each individual thing in it that aggregates a bunch of works, individual works. The thing to realize is that there isn't any relationship between the aggregated expressions and the aggregating expression, because this is only aggregating the whole thing, not each individual thing, if that makes sense. <laughs> I've had to read this and reread this 16,000 times before I kind of wrap my brain around it. Um, some things to remember, aggregates aren't whole part relationships. So we don't talk about it in terms of um, like we used to where, you know, the novel is the whole and there's maybe a part is like the preface that's added to it. So you can't really think about it that way anymore. You can't really describe it using, you know, this is part or part of or contains or contained. So that's a difference from the other RDA. So basically all you can say is sort of, it's a related work of another work or related expression of another expression. The good thing about all this is until this cha we change out of a MARC environment, there's not gonna be much change in how you catalog these currently. The policies are probably mostly gonna remain the same. And thankfully um, the Library of Congress will probably write you know, some kind of guidance on how to deal with this. So this is more of a theoretical structure thinking about a model rather than something that's gonna change practice all that much. Although the way they talk about it is confusing. <laughs> So, you know, in current treatment, you might say, you know, that this, this book that has individual chapters is the container of, you know, these different works. So this diff these different chapters that are their own works and how you would do that in a new potential treatment. And again, this isn't finalized is you would say either LC uses work manifested um, or no, RDA, I think, uses work manifested and LC uses related a work of work or whatever. So it's a little change in the, in sort of the, um, <coughs> identify, how you identify it, the, the thing, but, um, but it's not gonna change practice. You're still gonna have a 700 that, you know, has that title in it, should you, you know, wanna do that. Okay. We're getting near the end, I promise. Thank you for sticking with me. A couple of questions in the chat sure. before we move on. Sure. sure. Um, how persistent are the URIs and IRIs that you talked about before? Like they what should, are the odds we'll be filling these records with dead links? They should be absolutely persistent. They should be yeah. permanent, like Pearl, um, although Pearl's a bad example because they're not, but um, as, long as, as long as that, they're meant to be, um, persistent links. So they're meant as long as that vocabulary exists and doesn't like disappear. And you can't, I can't imagine that they are an architecture of the thesaurus, for example, is going to up and disappear one day. As long as right. that exists, there's going to be somebody who is in charge of making sure that those links are working. Right. Um, second question, records mm -hmm. that are pre-RDA and pre fervor <laughs> don't have WEMI links. Will we right. have to do a retro of these older no. records? No, one of the deals with this whole um, thing is that we do not do retrospective cataloging. So um, there may be a way at some point in the future to do, um, and this is one of the things that, you know, computer science brains that are much smarter than me are trying to figure out, um, is to get a machine to be able to do it. Um, that's sort of been one of the, 
one of the absolute sort of requirements is that um, anything has to be um, like if we change change to bib frame, for example, part of the deal in that is that the mark records have to be able to be um, crosswalked into the new system without people having to do it by hand. Because with two billion records in OCLC, there's no way that's going to happen. Gotcha. I think that's all in the chat for now. Okay, great. So Thank I you. promise we're almost near the end. So here's where the question of fictitious, synonymous, and non-human personages comes up. This I actually do know about because this is my responsibility. God help me. Um, so like we, we uh, mentioned in the library reference model, all agents have to be human beings. So real people who have lived or who are presumed to have lived. So the problem is what do we do with books purported to be written by animals or non-humans? And what do we do with animal actors and performers? And what do we do with works that are supposedly by spirits or angels or gods or another non-human entities? And obviously we still wanna record these things as access points because users are looking for them. Geronimo Stilton is a pseudonym and, but you know, our friendly neighborhood six or seven year old who's coming in looking for Geronimo Stilton only knows that the book was written by Geronimo Stilton. You know, he's not going to know that who the real person is behind that. So this is a problem we have to deal with. So what the LRM basically said, because it has this thing, the highest level it has is a thing has an associated association with a thing. They could say that Coca Gorilla thing has association with the film Coco, the gorilla that talks, which is another thing. So in LRM, this is perfectly okay. But our RDA didn't implement this REST entity. It decided to use a sub entity of REST, which is an RDA entity. The problem is an RDA entity is only one of those other 12 or 13 entities that are defined in RDA. <clears throat> Nomen's a designation that refers to an RDA entity. So again, it refers back to one of these RDA entities. And anything that's not a human isn't in any of the RDA entities because a person, an agent, a corporate body, those are all, you know, according to rule, those all, all have to be people. So uh, people, Personages who aren't people don't have relationships to nomen and RDA because nomen only have relationships to RDA entities, if that makes sense. RDA calls these fictitious and non-human appellations because they can't use nomen. It's just, you know, something that these things are called that we're not calling nomens. So there's two main types of non-humans who have agent type roles. And one, there's a clear use when a non-human or a fictitious person is a pseudonym for a real person. And then the second case is when non-humans are performing in an agent-like capacity. So if you have an animal performer, um, animal communication, so Coco the Gorilla's um, American Sign Language or bird song or whale record, you know, recordings of blue whales or humpback whales, which actually can be um, pinpointed to certain individuals. Um, and things that are um, that are written by spirits, angels, gods, um, or whoever acting as the creator of works. Up until now, we've just basically kind of said, okay, you say a spirit wrote this book, we'll, we'll just go with that. Um, under RDA, you can't do that. You have to kind of have a workaround for it. So in the case when a non-human is a pseudonym, or when a human is a, has a pseudonym, it, 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 we treat them exactly the same. Um, we didn't want to get into um, a place where we were trying to tell people, like, because a pseudonym is a pseudonym is a pseudonym. Um, you know, whether your pseudonym is The Rock or Geronimo Stilton, a fictitious mouse, or Richard Bachman, you know, who's which is a person sounding name that Stephen King uses, they're all pseudonyms. And we didn't want to get into the situation where people are having to say like, well, if it's an animal, somehow that's different because it's not, you know, I mean, if you've been around, I mean, they used to have huge arguments pre RDA about Geronimo Stilton and whether it was a pseudonym or 
if it was a fictitious person, he couldn't be the author and all this stuff. We didn't want to get into that. We didn't want to be splitting hairs. So if a fictitious or non-human is a, clearly a pseudonym for someone who's writing the books, you just make it a pseudonym. It's, you know, you just treat it like a pseudonym. So Geronimo Stilton's probably a pseudonym for Elizabeth Adami, or at least she wrote, we think she wrote the first books. And I will say that the Italian publisher of the Geronimo Stilton books maintains the fiction um, very strenuously that Geronimo Stilton writes the books. I mean, obviously a human does, but for children, they maintain, it's like Santa Claus, they maintain that fiction. Um, but we know that there's a person or persons behind them, whoever they may be. Um, Richard Bachman's a pseudonym for Stephen King. So it's a pseudonym that sounds like a person's name, but again, it's just a pseudonym. Um, Millie is a pseudonym for Barbara Bush because Barbara Bush wrote the book, you know, kind of speaking as though she was her dog. So these are all, you know, people who have pseudonyms. So we just treat them as, they're, as if they're, you know, real agents. If we know the real agent, um, there's two ways that you can treat it. You can record the author um, as Elizabeth Adami and relate the pseudonym to her in her authority record. Um, so the statement of responsibility would say by Geronimo Stilton, but the person entry access point would be Elizabeth Adami. You can do it that way. Um, and then Geronimo Stilton would just be a cross reference in her authority record. Or you can record Geronimo Stilton as the author. He can have his own authority record and you can relate the authority record for Elizabeth Adami to the Geronimo Stilton authority record. So there's a couple of different ways that you could do it. And how you decide to do it is probably gonna depend on, um, you know, things like how many, you know, Richard Bachman was a, for example, was a pseudonym that was only used by Stephen King a couple of times. And I can't remember if Richard Richard Bachman has his own authority record or not. Um, maybe an easier way to think about it is like Mark Twain, where his, um, you know, people have separate bibliographic identities. So Mark Twain's um, um, works, like novel works are under Mark Twain, but his sort of journalistic stuff is under his name, his actual real name, Samuel Clemens, and they sort of coexist. So you know, you would kind of make a decision about whether you just wanted the pseudonym to be a cross reference in a record, or if it was enough that it was a separate bibliographic identity and you would want to make a separate record for the pseudonym, but you can do it either way. You know, so otherwise you don't, you don't treat these any differently than you would treat a pseudonym that sounds like a person rather than an animal or something. If you don't know the agent, so somebody wrote as Kermit the Frog, but we have no idea. But we know it's a pseudonym for somebody, you know. Um, you would record the entity um, using a, an access point, either, either a structured or unstructured access point. And you would relate that to the work, you know, saying creator, agent of work, author, person, you know, something. And it would just be, the understanding would just be that, you know, Kermit the Frog isn't real. And so we're relating just the pseudonym of current Kermit the Frog to, you know, to that person, um, you know, but it's clearly a pseudonym. The problem comes in when you have animal and non-human creators and performers, because we do have cases, I mean, there are animals out there creating art. There's a Thai elephant orchestra that's creating music. Um, you have, um, you know, things like Coco the gorilla, who, um, you know, not only appears in documentaries, but also you know, actually communicates her own feelings and whatever did, because she sadly died. Um, and um, and you have animals who who perform. Um, so you know, like Lassie and whatever. And obviously, you know, if someone's a huge aficionado of Lassie movies, you want to have an access point for Lassie and movies about Lassie for people who are looking for Lassie movies. They can't be agents under the model. But they're obviously also clearly not pseudonyms. There's no real person behind Lassie. Lassie's just a dog. Lassie is Lassie. And actually, Lassie's name isn't even Lassie. And half the time, it's a boy anyway. But, you know, there's a clearly a dog, you know, that's acting under their own, you know, their own will. 
they do perform tasks and roles that we would attribute to an agent. You know, they act, they create, they do art. You know, in the case of Whale Song, you know, they're doing their own communicating that has little to do with people at all, um, but are definitely agents in the creation of that, that whole thing. So what RDA did was basically punted. Um, it, it just declares that these are non-RDA entities like subjects. Um, and they're outside the scope of RDA. But you can relate them by using that related entity relationship, which is the way that you relate anything outside of the scope of RDA to one of the RDA entities. So in Coco, the gorilla who talks right now, she's credited as on-screen participant, but that's an agent role, so she can't have that. So instead, you would label her as related entity of work, Coco Gorilla. So what you're saying is Coco is a related entity that's not an RDA entity to this work. So basically, you get her in there without breaking the rules. You're stretching the rules a little bit, but you can manage. And that's basically what was important to us was just make, to make sure that there was a way that we could record this as an access point. And, you know, after working on this and arguing till I was blue in the face that it was stupid to not have non people be agents um, and losing that battle. Um, we at least were like, okay, we got to figure out a way to get that in there, though. So I was happy because at least we can get it in there. So other slippery non-human type things, like I like to say, like gods, angels, spirits, and legendary characters, things like that. Um, you have to decide whether a non-human personage like a spirit is a pseudonym for a real person um, or is its own entity. And basically the cataloging agencies maintaining authority files um, will have to make those calls and depend and it's gonna and honestly whether something like an angel is considered a you know sort of a real being or not is is going to depend on the community and some communities you know the angel gabriel absolutely exists you know and in other communities it's like well angels don't really exist so that's going to vary you know depending and rda kind of leaves it open precisely for that reason so that different communities can kind of decide that on their own so different culture communities may have different opinions on what real and living or may have lived are um and that's, you know, and that's sort of why RDA leaves it, leaves it open. Um, so those are things that will have to be, you know, decided later. You know, right now, Gabriel, you know, Archangel Spirit, you know, supposedly is, you know, responsible for this work. So you could do related entity of work, Gabriel, Archangel Spirit, but some communities may consider that, you know, someone who lived or is believed to have lived. Um, because it's not a human, I would say we probably have to go the 700 route. But, um, but there can be, you know, there can be arguments made the other way as well. So implications for the National Authority file. Um, you can't code authority records for non-human people RDA, because they're not. And they can't have agent relationships to work. Um, and identification of non-human personages can't come from RDA or from the Library of Congress policy statements on RDA because they're outside the scope of RDA. Elsie has some ideas on how to handle this, um, but it hasn't made any firm decisions or policies. So be aware that it's still an open-ended question. So you can keep the existing national authority records in the file and allow them for individual non-human personages. Um, LC has basically said, let's keep fictitious groups and places in the authority file. And there'll be new instructions for how to sort of construct these headings and um, new mark descriptions. And again, I can't read my own writing. What did I want to say about that? Um, New mark descriptions, sorry. Um, oh, you would, use a, um, you would use a different convention source code for the 040 and the 075. So since you can't code them RDA, you would have to, you would wanna code those, you know, some other way to indicate that they're valid, but not valid necessarily under RDA as agents. 
So that's still to be determined by the Library of Congress. So in other news, um, the appendices, so those relationships and stuff have been moved over to the tab called Community Resources. And it's an area for particular language communities to add information. Um, so like English or Anglo-American cataloging, you know, will have its have its space and the Germans and the Finns will have their space. And so stuff like how to capitalize and, and punctuate English, for example, got moved to the English language because it's not really relevant for non-English language speakers. Um, if you use workflow, workflows in the original toolkit, I'm sorry to say those are going away. They're not disappearing, but editing and being able to add new work um, flows were supposed to end around the beginning of the month, but Jamie Hennelly at ALA wasn't sure if they were going to get to it. But just be aware that um, there's only a limited time to add new stuff. And I'm not sure if you can or not. We don't use workflows here. So um, I'm not that familiar with the process, but be aware that you won't be able um, to edit or add anything new. Um, LC is currently working on an application profile for RDA. Um, but as I was saying, if some of you were here at the beginning, um, our LC isn't expecting to change to the new toolkit until at least October 22nd. That's the very earliest, and it doesn't sound promising that it's going to happen even then. It'll be later. Um, so they're still working on it. And right now, all policy statements in the new toolkit should just be considered drafts. So be aware that they may change and um, they're still being worked on even as we speak. So now what? Yeah, I promise we're almost near the end. Don't panic. Um, SpongeBob says, um, the new RDA toolkit isn't being used currently for cataloging and probably won't be for a while. Um, like I said, not Elsie's not switching over at least until October of 2022. And I don't suspect that anyone is gonna switch over before Elsie does. Um, RDA heavily um, is going to re rely on application profiles. And that's where each community is gonna write sort of um, a manual on how to apply um, the, the, the sort of guidance that's in RDA for their own communities. So basically we're all waiting on LC to figure out how to um, deal with all this stuff, to write policy statements on it, to have examples, you know, to say there's a ton of options. So to say, you know, just like it does in RDA now to say apply this option or don't apply this option. Um, and from there to make it sort of more usable. Because um, right now it's not it's not terribly usable as a tool for cataloging, but it's not really meant to be. Um, the application profiles for the particular communities are meant to be more of a the manual or the rules part. So we're still waiting on that. Use this time to explore and investigate the toolkit if you have access to it um, before the switchover so that you, you know, you get used to finding things. Um, and be aware that tools, reference, and guidance is already being written to help people. I mean, people understand that this is impenetrable to a certain extent. Um, like I said, Chris Oliver, highly, highly recommend her book. And there's like three pages of references at the end of my slides um, of things I use to put this together, because believe me, I'm just as confused as the rest of you about some of this. Um, and things like better wording for some of the elements and stuff, you know, which are very confusing and hard to figure out what they're trying to say. Um, they've already been charged with sort of making that more user friendly. So like I said, be aware right now that it's everything is very much in flux and everything is very much um, um, still being worked on. It's definitely not a final product. So what you can do now, um, this is advice from Kathy Glennon, who's the head of the RSC right now. Um, get to know your RDA entities, make them your friends, love them and cherish them. That's my comment, not Kathy's. Um, get to know the RDA elements that describe those entities. And so look you know, at the bottom of those entity pages at the elements um, or search, you can search for them by element. You know, understand the distinction between an attribute that doesn't have a range and a relationship that does have a domain and a range and how to figure that out. Um, check out the element references and how it maps to the different encoding schemes like Mark 21 Dublin Core and to the library reference model. 
Um, get to know guidance. So get to know where that guidance on how to record things is. And those are often referenced right from the instructions in RDA. So they're linked right there. So if it says, you know, well, there's guidance on that here, you know, go ahead and look at it. Um, get to know the policies. You can actually set your RDA so that you see all the LCC policy statements when you're looking at it. Um, so look at those, look at the draft LCC and PCC and British Library policies. Um, other associations and um, organizations like the Music Library Association are also gonna have policy statements added. So um, when they're in there, take a look at them. And you can link to those policies from on the element pages um, to help with navigation. So again, there'll be links right to when you're in somewhere to say, you know, if you need help on this term or whatever, go here and get to know the resources that are available through the toolkit. So we can do it. That's my, uh, that's my, that's my advice for all of us. Um, I wanna give a big shout out to the colleagues on the RSC Plus project. Um, I have shamelessly borrowed slides and materials. I hopefully credited them all appropriately. Um, so Kathy Glennon, Gordon Dunsire, Kate James, um, Damien Eisminger, and Dominique Barassa in particular. Um, Kate James has a great, um, in the references here, there's a few things. She did a great whole series of videos on, let me see if I can find it. Um, these aren't in any order particularly, but um, the RDA Concepts video series. So they're short videos on things things like representative expressions or manifestation statements um, with examples, and they're really great. Um, and there are a lot of, um, the RSC has a whole, um, and they're on here, the RSC website also has a whole bunch of presentations that are available on different parts of RDA. So I, I would highly recommend um, checking those out. And thanks all of you, I went over, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so I hope there was at least some useful information in there and I didn't bore you to death, so. Thank you, Amanda. It was very, very informative. I'm gonna go ahead and, well, before I stop recording, are there any last minute questions? Um, put it in chat real quick. Uh, Linda raised your hand, so go ahead and unmute Linda. Well, actually, it's just a reaction. I, I was like, you know, clapping my hands. Thanks for the wonderful okay. presentation, Amanda. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate it. Very informative. I hope, yeah, I hope it was helpful. Um, my advice right now is just is is to please don't wig out. That's and believe me, I I have been wigging myself. So um, it's not a you know, it's it's literally, I was laughing. I was saying, I think that my job when I was on the RSC plus was to be the person who's like, I don't get it because I, I'm just a regular cataloger. You know, I'm not, I'm not a linked data person. I don't know a lot about, you know, computer programming or that sort of stuff. And so I was all this person who's like, you have to put that in English for me, or was the person who was saying, okay, no one is going to understand what that means. <laughs> so they are aware of the problem, I guess is what I am saying. And that um, I kind of wish that they hadn't they hadn't put the new toolkit out for public consumption because I think it made a lot of people anxious. Um, and I really think by the time it starts to get adapted, it's gonna be much, it's gonna make much more sense and be much use, much more usable. Yeah, Rachel, I think they do listen to people's complaints. I think the problem is just the timeline. It takes time to do everything. Um, and like I said, it, that's that's one of the reasons I wish they hadn't released it to the general public. I could understand releasing it to people who are writing application profiles or who are computer programmers or want to work with it in some sort of way. But I think um, putting it out there for sort of the general public when it's 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 sort of just it's really still in beta. I think confused everybody. Um, the good news is, is you have at least until next October um, before you really have to worry about applying any of it. Um, and like I said, probably longer than that. So it's coming, but you do have some time to sort of get used to it. And I think at some point um, it will be, um, there will be tools and things to help you that will make it much easier to deal with than it is right now. It's pretty, it's pretty much in a raw state right now. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.